And now, our next speaker is a game designer specializing in nonlinear narratives and storytelling through gameplay. He worked on The Witcher 1 and 2. Then he went mobile with Puzzlecraft and another case solved. And now he's a lead designer at 11 Beach Studios. He also teaches game and story design at the Łódź University of Technology. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Artur Ganszyniec. Warm welcome. Hello. Yeah. Okay. I hope that no one no one would come because it's. Yeah, I think this will be uh, this will be quite a quite a good uh, lecture to to close the uh, conference because I think it will provide more questions than answers. Mm, I would like to start with a disclaimer that I'm not sure if I'm right about what I will be saying. Uh, but this is how I feel about some parts of making games at this moment in my life and in my career. So I wanted to share it with you. Uh, I hope that you will have different opinions on some of the, the stuff I will be saying. And uh, I will do my best to keep you entertained. And maybe it will be an inspiration for some of you or for me. Uh, we uh, will be talking about... Uh, I will start with Hero's Journey. This is uh, a concept of a, um, of a storyline based on, on myths. Uh, it was, uh, it's like 17, or it's treated as 17 easy steps to, to make a, a heroic story. It was first introduced by, by Joseph Campbell in 1940s something like this. He was a mythologist and he compared myths from many parts of the world and noticed some similarities. Uh, he focused on stories about hero and heroic journey or hero's adventures and it goes like this that a hero goes on a quest but is reluctant then he goes on the quest, faces many challenges and distractions, and finally there is this deepest cave and, and, and the most dangerous crisis. Sometimes the hero dies and is reborn, and he gains something, an elixir, holy grail, something like this, and then he comes home transformed. He, uh, he can now live in both of the worlds, the known world where he lived and the unknown world when where the whole adventure took place. Uh, sometimes he is not fit to live in the normal world anymore. So it's something like this. Uh, it's, it's called a monomyth and it's a favorite American myth because it was introduced to Hollywood by, by Christopher Fogler. He wrote like a short summary of, of this huge work of Campbell and he taught it to Hollywood producers and script writers. So Star Wars, uh, Disney movies, Matrix, they are all um, by design, they are all stories based on, on the Campbell monomyth. So, so I think this whole structure could seem, could, could seem very like, uh, like an old friend because we've been playing such stories or watching su such stories for for, for a long time. And it is a good start to make, uh, to make stories in games because there are so many like, analogies between what Campbell said and, and how games are usually made because it's a quest-based structure or mission-based structure. So it's fit for RPGs and shooters and everything. Uh, the hero faces obstacles and... and distractions, and this is gameplay. This is sort of definition of gameplay. That, uh, and then, you know, this is this progression curve and climactic boss fight. So this moment of, of, of this Campbell, uh, Campbell's idea, this, this uh, heroic journey is also very commonly used in games. And then we have save and load. So there is an element or seem to be an element of death and rebirth uh, and we exp, we get gain you know gold m magical items so there is uh, an element of progress and, and transformation yeah but i think that something well you know it's 
it's, this structure is used so often that I think that it is a good start, or, or this is a good way of talking about stories in games, but, uh, you know, uh, the idea by, by Campbell was maybe not criticized, but, yeah, criticized by many other mythologists and anthropologists, because he focuses only on one part of, of the whole body of myths. And I think that looking at, at how games are made through the lens of, of hero's journey is also can cause us to miss some other things that are happening. So I think that something is missing in the picture. And in this talk, I would like to, uh, starting with the hero's journey, look at other elements of game design or, or story design that can be described using this nice mythical lens, but, uh, in, but that, that are missing in, this, in, in the basic model. So let's go outside our you know, comfort zone and uh, outside our, like, the easiest ways to do stuff, and, and let's try to look at what we do through a different lens, because sometimes using a metaphor is a way to notice things that we usually do not notice. So this is what I would like to uh, do with you. I will, would like to look at, the, at games uh, through some other lens. And because the, this talk is in inspired by the work of Campbell, so let's, let's use this mythic and religious and legendary lens. And we'll be looking for this elixir for me, the Holy Grail. The elixir is a compelling story told in a way that only games can tell a story. So, so let's look for, for how to make a story, a game that's unique uh, to the medium and that can be you know, a, a good story, compelling. So, so we will start with looking at other forces apart from the hero that are at play. So, you know, at gods or fate or, or universe, we, we will talk about death and its complicated relationship with, with the hero, because hero and death, uh, that's, that can, you know, that can be, uh, well, that's, that's complicated, yeah? And uh, we'll be asking some questions and maybe there is an answer I would like to share with you, but I don't know if this answer will work for you. It works for me, but I'm not sure if, it, if it's universal. So let's start with gods and their playthings. Yeah, these are the, the Greek gods. They, they are very popular, good franchise. Uh, so in myths, gods treat mortals as, as play, playthings, as, as toys. They toy with mortals, they use heroes to play with other gods, yeah? Uh, as, as tools in, in their own games. Uh, Greek gods are known from, for you know, sending madness and making heroes behave in a really strange way because yeah, they are gods and they can. And in some religions or, or, or belief systems, like in, in voodoo, Loa are uh, literally riding humans, using them as vehicles or, or, or as horses to, to ride on. And does this all sound familiar when, when we look at, at, at what we do? Because I think that players are gods. For, for protagonists, players are gods. They are those forces outside the understanding of a you know, game hero. And in multiplayer, players, what, what, what players do? They use heroes to uh, fight with other gods. So it's totally a mythic situation. Uh, and when we look at, at, at the goals that a player has, player wants to win, win the game or, or, or um, exploit the game, maybe to push the, push the boundaries or just to vent some emotion or, or have fun. All those motivations uh, which directly influence how a hero in a story behaves, because in, in gameplay, a hero behaves as, as the player told him to. So, so these are motivations that are totally outside what the, what the hero knows. They are from, from some other plane of existence, but they influence how the hero behaves. So it's, it's a very mythic situation. And sometimes, sometimes the goals of the players are totally different from the, 
from what's sensible for, for the hero, or for the hero, uh, they are different from what the hero wants, yeah? Uh, when we play, we often just, I don't know, attack a boss just to see what happens, or open this door, or jump out of the window to see if, if game designers thought about scripting the situation, and this is sensible for us, but sometimes it's totally not sensible from the, from the hero's point of view. So this, is, th this reminds me of this madness that gods are sending to, to, to heroes in, in myths. And sometimes, sometimes, the hero can, can challenge a god. This is my favorite scene from Grand Theft Auto 4, when, when Nico Bellic decided to kill Uncle Vlad, and I was like, I don't want to do this. Like I like, I maybe not. I I don't like Uncle Vlad, but he's he's the quest giver. I need quests. I need to progress the game. Don't kill him. Yeah. But Nico Bellic said, no, no, no. We we have to kill him. He he dis disrespected us. So he forced my hand. The hero forced my hand. I didn't want to do this, but I did, and I gained respect for this character in this moment. And this is uh, what, what uh, in the Bible, uh, Jacob does something like this. He wrestles, wrestles with God to, to win some favors, so he also challenges God, and it's good for him. But usually, when we look at myths, it's not good for, mm, you know, for heroes to challenge gods, yeah? Look at the, at the Greek myths. There is a lot of, of people skinned alive, uh, eaten by their dogs, or chained to some rock to have birth, eat their liver out, because they, they challenge gods. And uh, so you can fall from grace when you challenge a, a god's hand. And this is with games. Sometimes, when a game forces me to do something, I respect the character, but Usually, I just say, oh, this game is rubbish, and I throw it away. So this is, I think, a thing to, to consider. So we have heroes, we have gods, but when we look at, uh, especially at Gre Greek myths, but also at, uh, on, on the nor Norse stuff, there is fate. Yeah? This is Ragnarok, you know, this great battle at the end of time when, when the Norse gods kill each other, and they knew who would die, who would live. Probably this already happened, and they knew this will happen, and they couldn't do anything about it, because faith is uh, something st stronger than gods. So we have this, this faith, uh, this, this force that is one of the strongest forces in the universe, and you cannot escape it. You can ask Oedipus. Yeah, he probably wasn't really into sleeping with his mother, but yeah, that was his faith. He could do nothing about it. And when we look at how we make games, well, I think that plot is, is fate. Yeah? Uh, the world in a game is constructed in such a way that no matter what I do as a player, and no matter what the character wants, there are some boundaries that physically cannot be broken because the game is made such a way. Uh, the game can on, uh, end only in the, in the way it was designed to. So by writing a plot line or, or making, making some, some systems, some mechan mechanisms, we set the boundaries the story can go. And we can make it so the character and the god writing the character uh, would go with the flow, or we can do it so they would fight with their fate all the time, and each, each way has its consequences. Uh, and when we are doing uh, or creating a game, we're creating a universe. Yeah, this is this nice story of Adam and Eve being thrown, thrown out of the Eden. Uh, and yeah, they have to enjoy the creation. But usually the, the world is not perfect. And this is especially true with, with games. But when we look at religion or, or at, at myths, uh, Greeks, mm, I think they were the first who started thinking about why the world is not perfect, and then they came out with this idea of the Muge, that is an imperfect creator, well, a god, but not the omnipotent, all-knowing god, but, you know, just a god who has his problems, and he created the world, and uh, his problems became the world's problems. Uh, so. Gnostics, 
or, or, or um, sometimes see the world as a mystery to be solved, or maybe a prison to be broken from. And this is very game-like situation, because we as designers are imperfect creators. We uh, create an, a universe to fulfill a role, but we are not perfect. We have limited budget, we have limited time, we have limited skills. Uh, we have to communicate with many other actors and co-creators, and a universe is created, but is, it is not perfect. So we are the merge just in this, in this metaphor we are, we are using. But I don't know how the world we are living in, but worlds created for games, uh, they have its own purpose. So they are a mystery, that can be solved, and sometimes they are treated as prison that you know you have to escape from. And looking at this modding scene is hardcore agnostic. You know they are those guys who are using secret knowledge to change the uh, rules governing the the world. It's also quite mythic. But uh, what is important here is that uh, we like to treat. Games, uh, game worlds as simulation, as something real, but I ne they never are. are. The, the worlds in games all, all, always are created, created for a purpose, and they are just, you know, the board we are, we are playing on. And a uh, very important part of this play, of, of every heroic situation and of, of every myth, is death. And death, I think, is a special case in, in, in games, in stories in games. I suppose that there are some other topics that, that can be singled out and, and analyzed, as we will do with death, but I, I, I think we will start with death. Uh, this is the death and taxes joke, but I uh, added it just to um, notice that in many, in many myths, your financial sta status is, uh, that, uh, is very important to uh, how you do after death. You know, in e Egypt, when you have a nice pyramid, you, really, you have really nice afterlife. When you don't have money for the pyramid, no afterlife. Uh, in Greek mythology, you have to pay Haron to take you to, to Styx if you have no money. Sorry. Yeah. In Hawaii, there is this, this belief that, that only the noble families have, an, have afterlife and, and commoners, when they are ghosts, they just jump off a cliff and dissolve in the ocean. And in games, you have usually, you know, insert coin to cheat death. So there is an analogy, but this is just, you know, this is just gimmick. Uh, what's more important is that in many myths, death is a result of, 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 bro of breaking rules, of playing against the rules. If you know the story with, with a snake, an apple, yeah, some people breaking rules, and this resulted in death. This is a story that in many variations like, is repeated all over the, the world. In many mythologies, the death is or originated by some mistake or some sin, some trans transgression. So basically, we believe, as humans, that, that, that you die when you break the rules. You may not know the rules, because death is not really very, you know, it's, it's not always about justice, but, but when you break the rules, you die. And, and basically, this is what it is in games, yeah? You, break, you, you are playing against rules, when, when you are breaking rules, your character usually dies, yeah? You should, you should be jumping on platforms, you miss the platform, you die. You, you should be shooting enemies, you don't shoot enemies, enemies shoot you, you die. Yeah? And at the same moment, every religion, every society has its own, uh, they have their own ideas about death and how death should work, uh, and not all death, uh, deaths are equal, and so it is in games. Yeah? Uh, every genre, every type of game have a slightly different approach to character dying. And usually, this approach to death is very inconsistent. And uh, this, is, this is Kratos from, from God of War, one of my favorite franchises. And he's a badass. Yeah? He's killed, he goes to Hades, he fights his way back 
to back to the living world, and we know that he's, he's the badass because, you know, he just escaped from the afterlife. And like, I don't know, five seconds later, you are killed, and this is the screen, you have died, restart from the last checkpoint. And you, the story death and the gameplay death, they happen in the same game within like 10 seconds one from another, and one is treated in one way, and the other is treated in some totally different way. Story death is totally dip different in than gameplay death. You know the situation. There is a shooter, you shoot a lot of enemies, then in, in a cutscene a character is shot. Poof, like, like this. No saving throws, uh, no, I don't know, no, no last second rescues, because one death is important and the other is not important. In most games, gameplay death is, is just a bad dream. Like, it, it happens, but it, it doesn't really happen. Like, the victorious hero is immortal. When you end the game and look back, this particular hero never died, because every time he died, he reloaded from the last checkpoint. So all those deaths were not real. They were like, more like a rhetoric, mm, like a mean of expression, a metaphor, a metaphor maybe for, for the hero's fears, uh, um, for his lack of belief. He thought, oh, I might, I might die, this, this might be dangerous. And he dies, but, but the death is not real. So this is something to think about. I, I, I feel this is important. Uh, I'm not sure how, so let's look at games that have a more consistent approach to deaths. And we'll start with roguelike. This is Adam. Yeah, you are playing this character, like with fighting with other ASCII characters. Very hardcore game. Uh, and, you know, this is a uh, roguelike, so when you die, you are dead. This character is dead, there are no save system, you create another character, restart the whole world, the whole story, and after many, many characters, finally, you can win the game. But the structure is more like Russian fol folk tales, when only the youngest brother uh, is successful. All the older brothers made some mistakes and die, died, and the youngest brother uh, finally gets the princess, kills the dragon, and stuff like this. So, so roguelikes are more like folk tales. To folk tales, I think. But with with a slight modifications, we can also use this metaphor to th think about roguelites, maybe like like this cycle cycle of rebirth, when when there is another mechanism that when you die something leaps on, like, I don't know, in Faster Than Light, you unlock a, a starship and then you die, but the starship is available, so you, like, accumulate cal karma over lifetimes and your knowledge, your good deeds and the things you unlocked finally gets you the final reward, and this is a bad joke. The reward, of course, is Nirvana, because you can finally stop playing and, and the character just dissolves. But this is more or less consistent approach to death. And there are games where death is just not an option. This is a screen from, from The Witness. Probably it is a game, it is, you know, this walking simulator with, with puzzles. It's a game about being alone with your thoughts, I think. But there are some, some other walking simulators, like Firewatch. There is a death in Firewatch, but you, you never die. You are never in risk, but death is something real that happens to some other people. Or we can make games when you are constantly dodging the bullet, when, when death it uh, doesn't happen because there are mechanisms in the, in the game world that prevents you from dying. Like, like in Life is Strange, when, when, where the protagonist can rewind time, so every time she would die, it doesn't happen because she rewinds time and, finds, uh, and she can find some other solution. And this allows for making a game that is all about fighting with your destiny, but the approach to death is very consistent. Or uh, when, you, uh, when we look at, uh, at Heavy Rain, there are moments where some characters may die, but the other characters, well, 
cannot die. Just, just the story is written so. This, this is easy to do with, with this choose your own adventure structure. Uh, sometimes with gameplay, uh, added gameplay elements like, like the rewinding of time in, in, in Life is Strange, but this is also a very consistent approach to death. When someone dies, dies. When someone doesn't want to die, you have a mechanism that can prevent the death. There are some uh, games when uh, this is Dark Souls, so yeah, that anyway, but yeah, that, that's what I think. It's a, a bit of, you know, the Purgatory. You have to, you know, suffer uh, and suffer, but finally something good uh, can came out of it. But in in Dark Souls and in game game like this, when you die in the game, you in the gameplay you die in the in the story, and then you are reborn in the story. Sometimes with with some other uh, elements or some some other extra complications. And sometimes there are games that like like Journey. Yeah, this is the endless cycle. This is a game, I think it's a perfect metaphor for life, as far as games uh, are concerned. This is a, sto a story about lo looking for your own way, about relations with, with other people, and about life as a cycle. And I don't know if you can say that there is death in this. Yeah, maybe there is death in this story that's open to interpretation, but, but this is also a consistent approach. So, so we looked at some games uh, that have consistent approach to death and uh, we can compare it with, with most of the games where death is just a mean of expression. It's, it's inconsistent gameplay. Death is different from, from death in, in the story. So we use this mythical metaphor to, to look at, at character as a hero at play players who, who act like gods, they are the big unknown, and sometimes they force to act, uh, force the hero to act in a very um, irrational way, because that, that's how, how gods are. And they all, the gods and, and the, uh, the hero uh, are working in a, are fighting with their destiny in, in a world that was created by, by uh, imperfect creators, but this is just a metaphor, because in real life uh, only the gods are real, only players are real. We are making games for players. Uh, it is easy to think about the story from, from the hero's point of view, but at the end uh, uh, players are, are the ones who, who live the story. And heroes, as much as we admire them, they are just playthings. They are just, just, just tools or, or toys, and they are used for entertainment, but I think the, the, the most important thing a, a hero can contribute is to provide a lesson uh, for the player. Let's, let's look at Gilgamesh. He, he's the, the first hero of, of humankind. He's, uh, he's the hero of the first epic in history, or the first epic that, that survived. This is the very beginning of, of literature. And uh, he had many adventures, and his greatest quest, apart, apart from you know, being a king and slaying monsters and, and being the favorite of gods, uh, his greatest quest was, was to, to escape death, to, to cheat death, to find a way not to die. And he embarked on the quest, he had many, many adventures, to, and he failed, and he failed. And the story survived, and this is still a very good story because this Gilgamesh, who was like Superman, celebrity, monster, slay, monster slaying, sex symbol, and a king, and he also died. He had to die. So this is something that we can really relate to. Yeah? We want to be Superman, sex symbol, celebrity, kings, uh, and we have to die. Yeah? So it's nice to know that uh, that yeah, so so th th that is w what makes this story through uh, true, uh, and I think that this is the power in in myths because myths are just stories that survived for like tens of thousands of years. They changed, but 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 they are very very old stories, and I think they survived because we as human humans we feel that stories. 
told in myths are important. And I, I think that we see them as important because there is a truth in them and they help us to understand the world and they ring true. Ring true. And I think this might be uh, like, like the truth. Truth may be hidden in how myths uh, are using gods and, and heroes. And this is uh, from Mahabharata. The blue guy is Lord Krishna, and he's the charioteer for an for, uh, archer known, uh, uh, called Arjuna. And uh, this is an illustration that sometimes a gods are riding heroes, but sometimes gods, gods are riding with heroes. And I think that, that uh, especially in games, when we can achieve such a situation that, that a player merges with the character, that they perceive the same goals, have the same thoughts, and they both fight their destiny in this imperfect world, wanting the same thing and doing the same thing, I think that's the moment where the story becomes, becomes very important. And uh, th there is a, a term for this moment when, when a character becomes uh, a player, or player becomes a character, or god becomes a hero, and hero becomes an emanation of a god. And this is a term used bo both in mythology and in game design, and it's avatar. Yeah? So I think... Uh, when we can achieve the moment that your character is really your avatar, that's your vehicle into the story, that, that's the moment when the stories are very deeply felt by the players. And so we are near the moment we are fighting our ultimate boon, and maybe we can find a lesson from this big metaphor I was, I was spreading in front of you. So, so for me, I don't know if for you, but for me, the elixir, the answer is that you should treat your heroes and your gods and death with respect. Like, treat, treat players as major, like, humans, and treat characters as humans also. Uh, acknowledge that, that, that sometimes players can have very different motivations from the character, but try we can try to make universes, game, game worlds in such a way and write the fate of the characters in such a way to draw the player to believing into what's happening. And I think that... Um, and we just focus on death, but I think that there are some other topics like, like love, emotions, that should be treated in a consistent way and very serious way. And I believe that if we do, that, do, that, do this, we can create stories that are really deep and really moving and have the power of myths and if we just stick to how we always do this and, and use just, you know, industry standard, I'm afraid that, that our games will be just, you know, entertainment. They will not be stories, they will be just gossip and this is nothing more wrong with entertainment as such. But I believe that sometimes we should try to make games something more, because I believe that sometimes stories in games can be something more than just gossip, and that's what I, what I believe at the moment, so thank you. Thank you very much. And wh what do you think? Thanks for this talk. Um, are you familiar with Dr. Jordan Peterson lectures? I, I, I'm afraid not. He's a Canadian psychologist who mm -hmm. is very into myths and mm -hmm. he's basically telling quite the same thing as you, mm -hmm. uh, that the myths are uh, meta-true. It means that there are stories that uh, help people survive because the myths, Jesus or uh, other gods, uh, Asian gods, uh, the stories about them is like a, um, like a guidebook for people how to, how to survive. And he's, he's absolutely fascinating. If you are, if you are uh, Pe Peterson? into this, Jordan Peterson. He's very controversial because he was uh, some, he's, uh, he ha had his voice about this gender, um, 
I don't know how to say this gender thing, which is okay. in states, and he he was opposing it kind of from the okay. uh, psychology point of view, and some some thing some people uh, name him a. Uh, yeah, like a racist even or something, but he's, he has his YouTube channel and he has about thousands of hours of lectures and he's talking about this thing exactly and for me it was very inspiring, so... Okay, thank you for, and for, for, for once this again, th thanks for your talk. Okay. Thank you. Uh, how would you mm, describe from a player's perspective the difference between uh, gameplay death and story death? And uh, second question, would you agree that uh, designer's goal should be, maybe not goal, but that designers should aim uh, at making player believe or not be able to tell one from the other? Um, yeah, because, you know, in, um, I was giving example for inconsistent death, approach to death, and consistent approach to death, in, and in bo both si situations uh, there could be a get death in gameplay, but when the approach is consistent, uh, when death in gameplay occurs, uh, death in story occurs. The story acknowledges that the character died and either re resurrects him in the story or ends the story of the character and, and starts a story of some other character. And I think this is a consistent approach. And, uh, and when we do this, this rings truer. And in this God of War example, sometimes the character died in the story and he ended in Hades and he fought his way back, but then he died and he didn't end in Hades. He just respond in the last checkpoint and the story ignored it. It was like, oh, he died. No, 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 he, he didn't die. And this is something that reminds you that this is not a real story because this death was just make-believe. It was just, you know, haha, we, oh, oh, let's not talk about this. This was just gameplay. And I think that when in a story you feel that there, there are moments of just gameplay, you, you are losing the player, or, or the story becomes just, just play. Yeah, so that's, that's what I was trying to say, I think. Okay, thank you. I have a mic. Thank you, uh, thank you for the presentation. Uh, I wanted to ask you actually about uh, games like Little Big Planet. So basically, you have a world and you let your creations, so the avatars in the game, create other worlds. So are they gods? <laughs> well, you know, I used a metaphor that is probably not suitable for every type of game. So, yeah, maybe this is the situation when... Actually, you have some generation of gods in many mythologies, so maybe <laughs> this is like... The player is the, is the uh, in many African mythologies, there is this distant god who created it all and then just fucked off, yeah? And, and there are gods who are ac acting within the world, so maybe this is the situ situation. But, you know, I use this metaphor to, to ju justify some conclusions or intuitions, and uh, I don't think that it could be really apply applied to, to every type of game. But I don't know, yeah, we, we could try. Uh, that okay. was a good one. Thanks. <laughs> If you have no, no other questions, so just thank you for your attention and... Thank you very much.